How are you? Hope everyone's doing well. Um, we decided we'd do a video tonight in honor of Purim. Um, and uh, the time that we're in, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get together with uh, in, in groups and things. And so we're just going to be doing this from home this evening. And uh, and uh, we're glad that you're joining us uh, either either live or later on checking us out. In recognition and remembrance and celebration of the biblical festival of Purim, uh, meaning lots, it's one of the uh, words from lo for lots that is used, and because that had a lot to do, there's a lot, there's a whole lot that had a lot to do with this timing, but the the that's where it gets it in its name. Good. Okay, <laughs> I thought you were going to say something more about the lots, but you know, and that's uh without. <laughs> I, I have to be careful because I I can get go off on lots of rabbit trails that things that I find interesting and it, you know there's like ten chapters to the book of Esther and there's a lot to say on the subject of Purim and Esther and so I just have to be careful not to go too far off off uh, say off script there is well, no script no and i mean there's a lot of like you said there's a lot of interesting things about this but we don't want to be here for three hours talking about everything we yeah. find interesting so yeah. we just wanted to provide something for you guys on the night uh, that is celebrated purim celebrated um all over the world by people that do the traditional jewish calendar and so we just what nothing just okay. listening we uh hmm. just wanted to uh you know come and offer a presence uh, to commemorate that and to just have a discussion about this book every time I go through it especially if I listen to it I I don't get as much out of it as if I read it and as I was reading through it today just so many things just kept jumping out at me and I, th I think did I have I ever really read this did I really see this with the right eyes I mean there's so many recurring sequences of numbers of the sevens i mean just over mm -hmm. and over and over it just seems to be such an archetypal book with so much information packed in there that just at first glance you know it's an interesting story but then in terms of symbolism and really getting into the meat of it there's just a lot there to unpack yeah i've never really i don't know why but i've never really taken the time to do a real in-depth study of this book and i you know it kind of makes me want to now after Julie and I are talking a little bit about some of the subject matter. Um, for those, you know, I, I more and more realize how out of touch that I am because, like, in the last couple of days, uh, there was a couple of ladies that I talked to and that you would think, you know, they're pretty pretty serious about their religion, you know. And uh, and I, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but they are. And... And I mentioned something about Purim, and they didn't know what that meant. And mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, like in the book of Esther, and I could tell, I don't even know that they'd heard of the book of Esther either. Case. You know, and, Yeah, I'm serious. I mean, that's, it's it's sad, but that's, and, and you know, these, the, these people that, I, that I'm referring to are very serious about, I mean, they're, they're not, they're not even what you would call lukewarm. I don't think as much as most of the other people, but it just they're, the biblical illiteracy is uh, is pretty pretty bad problem, and and we I think we lose we don't have we're just out of touch with a lot of that. Well, and so anyway, yeah. my point was is that maybe you could give a quick synopsis and kind of of the of the book of Esther and, and these events. I mean. It's not that long, you know, you can you can read it for yourself later and if you don't want to do that, you can listen to it online or there's even movies. There's a I remember a movie released maybe 10 or 15 years ago maybe called One Night with the King. I think we have it or we we've watched it, Something. but yeah. Anyway, there's there's movies also about this, but when you get something or I do, if I listen to it, I get kind of it's like it activates one part of the brain maybe and then if when I read it it kind of overlays with that and I 
I'll hear things that I don't maybe notice when I'm reading, and then I notice things that I'm reading that I don't notice when I'm hearing. And so mm-hmm. it's interesting to kind of combine all that. But so a synopsis overview. Um, this is, and I don't know exactly what the year is here. I should, but I don't. It's after Judah had been carried to Babylon by a few generations because Mordecai was the great grandson. From what I understand of the text, Mordecai was the great grandson of the man who was carried away from Jerusalem and taken to Babylon. And then over the course of the years, Nebuchadnezzar was, um, he fell to the empire of the Medes and Persians, and so they took over. And then four generations later, Mordecai is here, and he took in Esther. It's his cousin. She was the daughter of his uncle, and she lost her father and mother somehow, so he adopted her. And she's living, I guess, in obscurity. People don't really know who she is. Um, Why would they? And then he's, I don't know that it ever really says exactly what his role is in Shushan, but he's he's around the king. Yeah, Yeah, I don't know that it specifies. I I don't know, but he's close enough to the king to kind of make a difference in certain things that unfold. And then there's... Well, he apparently was brought in closer after, later on, after his cousin... Hadassah or Esther was brought into the palace. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, the, there's well, nothing to indicate before that. The book opens up with, um, I think it's a Hazarus. I'm, I mean, I'm saying that right. He has this great big feast, and I think it said 180 days, which is six months. And when I sat down and realized how long that kind of a feast is, I mean, a six-month feast, that just boggles my mind, where all the different provinces, princes of the provinces had come, and he had 127 yeah, provinces, 127 provinces mm-hmm. from India to Ethiopia. And so it was a pretty extensive region. Mm-hmm. And it went on six months. And then after the six months was over, he initiated another seven-day feast for a smaller group of people, for his servants and I guess his innermost circle. And I'm going from memory here. Um, on the seventh day of that seven-day feast, following the great big feast, He is bringing, you know, it says he shows his majesty and he's showing his riches to these people and tells the eunuchs, which there are seven eunuchs, to go get Vashti and have her appear before them wearing her golden, wearing her royal crown. Well, there's a lot of people that have said over the years that of different things that he was asking Vashti to do from appearing without clothes and just in her crown. I don't know where they're getting, <laughs> getting that. No wonder you would say no. I mean, but yeah, it's not in the text. No, like it's that. not. And so I don't know why people teach that. Maybe they know something I don't. And then some people say that he wanted her to dance before them, but she was having her own feast in another part of the palace with women. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what all transpired. He wanted her to appear in her regalia so that he could show her beauty to these people. And this was considered, from what I understand, in those days, um, sort of degrading to, when we look at the, uh, from what I remember, the genealogy of Vashti, I believe she was like the Mm. granddaughter of um, Belteshazzar, who was, so we're talking back in the time of of Daniel here. Babylon. You you might remember, yeah, and the the writing on the wall and all that. She basically came from royalty, and in that sense, from what I understand, she may have outclassed, actually, this king. That the king maybe didn't have the, the clout or the gravitas, in her mind at least, <laughs> well, uh, as she did from coming from the royal seed. You know. Well, and she doesn't have any control over what he's doing. And he's mm-hmm. been out here doing this feast for this amount of time, six months, and then another seven-day feast. And so she's over here entertaining the women and doing her own thing, minding her own business, whatever. I don't, mm-hmm. you know. And I just put myself in that situation. I'm, I'm over here busy while you're busy, and you give me a decree to come and appear in my finery so people can gaze on my beauty and you can be the man or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of imposing my own present-day feelings What's on wrong it. With but that? Well, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe nothing. Give me may... another beer, lady. <laughs> <laughs> maybe something. <laughs> you may regret that. <laughs> maybe something, maybe nothing, but she declines. And mm. so he sends this request by the word of the seven eunuchs. 
she re refuses. And they come back and tell him, and he's very mad, and ends up, um, I'm tr trying to remember all the sequence of events, but basically just says to them, um, what do we do about this? And they're like, well, she not only basically has dissed you, but she has done a disservice to all the princes of all the provinces and all the people in the provinces because the women will hear that she's done this and they will start to despise their husbands in their own eyes following her example and will just lose control of the whole situation. So That's where it all went wrong. <laughs> it's either the yeah. serpent and the fruit or it's something like this. But, yeah. um, and so they, the law of the Medes and the Persians is different than other cultures. Once it goes into effect, it is not changeable. So... And that's a whole nother discussion why this king needs to be a little bit more deliberate about who he gives his ring to and his authority. Yeah, do what's right in your own eyes or whatever. And once it goes into law, you can't change it. So it might be more deliberate if you're going to be king. But so he, he appeals to a different set of seven, seven wise men, it says, that are knowledgeable in law and justice. And they're the highest ranking people in his court or whatever and it lists them and I ne have never done a study of the names of the eunuchs and the names of these seven but two sets of seven seven eunuchs and seven wise men and w I forget his name one of them speaks up and says well let this be done where she is not to be queen anymore and she doesn't get to come in front of you she refused to come and now she won't ever come before you and uh, she won't be queen anymore and so they write it into law. And then it says, I think maybe in chapter two, that Ahasuerus um, basically gets over his madness, his being mad, and he remembers Vashti and what was done. And the tone of it is just that there is kind of remorse or sadness. And so his noblemen come and say, well, Let's do this. Appoint officers throughout all your provinces, all your 127 provinces, and let beautiful young virgins be found to go through this beautification process that's going to last 12 months. And then whoever you like better than Vashti, then let her be queen instead of Vashti. Instead of Vashti. And so... He's like... Yeah. Hmm, sounds mm -hmm. good to me. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't it please the king well, and he said, okay. And so in the time, I th maybe I've already said this, it's the third year of his reign when he has this great big six-month festival. And then it says, after this process of gathering the women, it takes 12 months of beautification in the Chushan, the capital. A purification process. Yeah, okay. where six months they go... They have treatments of myrrh oil, and then the next six months, it's other oils and just different things. But it's a 12-month purification process. So they didn't just drag them off and put them on the horses and just throw them in there that night or whatever. It took a while to appoint officers, to gather the women, to get them in there. So however long it took them to find the ladies and get them to Shushan, from that point, it was a year. And so Hadassah was taken. And Mordecai told her not to tell who she belong, you know, what who her people were. He told her not to do that. And when she came in, she came under the authority of Haggai, the keeper of the women, who was a eunuch. There was a different eunuch in charge of the concubines. Once he was with them, they went into the concubine house. I don't know what to call that. And so it was a different eunuch. But she found favor in the eyes of Haggai. And I think it says in the seventh year of the reign of the king, she came into him. And so he had the festival or the feast in his third year. And then it was in his seventh year that she actually came before him. And she had been given seven maidens by Haggai. I mean, there's all these sevens just constantly in the story. That's just fascinating to me what this is trying to beat us over the head and kind of tell us. Mm -hmm. And... And she didn't take anything in unto the king other than what Haggai um, suggested. And she was, she found great favor in his eyes. And so he put the crown on her head, made her the queen. And at this point, I think Mordecai 
overheard something or somehow found out about a plot to kill the king? So he, you know, because he's the cousin of Esther, or Mordecai, and she's going to be going by the name, or um, Hadassah, and she's going to be going by the name Esther, because of his relationship with her, he gets, it doesn't really state if he gets some sort of position, but apparently he's kind of getting some sort of stipend or benefits from the government now because of her high position hmm. because she's you know moved in there but uh yeah it's he overheard a plot to uh on uh, an assassin, assassination plot on the king and uh he reported it and it was recorded and everything and then everybody pretty well forgot about it and so then the it'll return back to this this thing later because this this story has a lot of you know great elements to it uh, you know poetic justice and all the really neat things of great story well great plotting yeah it is i mean it it's great funny plotting. and so he the attempt on the king's life is thwarted because of this mm -hmm. and it's recorded but nothing is ever really done or said and then it says just kind of mysteriously to me you know it goes into in the beginning chapters the eunuchs' names, the high-ranking wise men's names, and it doesn't ever mention Haman at that point. Oh, but then much later, of a no, there's really not much of a background. And what I just find it interesting that some of these characters to have these high positions, they're kind of they kind of rise from ex, ex, um, obscurity a little bit. But it says that the king appoints Haman and raises him up to a place of honor like above his nobles and I don't think if I'm remembering I don't really think it says why it just he just did and as part of that raising up you're supposed to give him homage and respect I guess by bowing and kind of deferring to him or whatever physically like yeah yeah you're Haman whatever we respect you and so he's going through the different parts of Shushan and he comes to Mordecai and Mordecai doesn't bow <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we kind of crack up laughing at this part. It's a little funny to you us. You might want to give a little bit of Mordecai's pedigree because I think it's important, and it does tell us it which does. tribe he was from, and yeah. it kind of helps kinda to give a little bit of that uh, characteristic or personality trait. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, and if you remember in Genesis when... Jacob is blessing his sons before his death. Genesis 49. He talks about Benjamin, Benjamin being a ravenous wolf and basically kicking everybody's bohinies, you know, in battle. And then there's different stories about the Benjamites just being a horrifically ferocious tribe, almost killing. I mean, when they... There was, there was a point in history where the different tribes came together against the tribe of Benjamin, and Benjamin and kicked them Chapter, bad. Uh, 24, I think, of Judges. And so it just has this historical, there's a historical account of... Saul was a Benjamite. Yeah. Uh, the Apostle Paul Apostle was a Paul Benjamite. Apostle Paul was a Benjamite. So, yeah. I mean, you, you kind of get this, when you put all these things together, you start getting kind of a personality profile of, of you know, being kind of fierce where they think they're right and not bending or whatever. That was the origin of the Benjamite sandwich, too. <laughs> yeah. You have no proof of that. Yeah. <laughs> None. Um, and so he's a Benjamite and he just doesn't bow. He just, he just doesn't. And no matter what wealth or honor or high rank that Haman has, it incenses him that he, that Mordecai will not bow to him and give him his due. And so he, I forget some of the details, but basically he goes into the king and he's like, there's this group of people in your realm that basically follow their own laws and they're not really following your laws. They're doing their own thing and they're not really, uh, there's not a point to them. They really shouldn't live anymore. And Hazarus is like, okay. Do what seems good to you. I mean, he even said, "I'll throw in all this money of 10, my 000, own." Ten thousand, yeah. I think, ten thousand talents of silver. Yeah, something like that. I mean, it was a lot of money into I mean, the king's treasuries. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Well, and I mean, he he's acting like he's doing all of this for the king and doing the king a big favor, and that he's out of his loyalty and love and respect for him that he's going to do all this great thing. Well, and even if he is, he's he knows what side his bread is buttered mm -hmm. on, and I mean. 
it's not, yeah, it's not for his own selflessness or whatever. And so they cast lots, he and the people that he gets to do all this, as to the best time mm -hmm. to annihilate the Jews. Mm -hmm. And it says little kids, women, mm -hmm. like not just the men, but wiped right. them out as a people in yeah. the provinces of Persia and mm -hmm. Medo. Medo. Medo and some of the, uh, you know, there's lots of different commentaries on this kind of thing too you know of this i know i've got some some books that go into this that i don't think you've read that's pretty interesting that they're casting these lots and trying to decide what month and they're like no this month wouldn't be optimal because mm. the mall this mausel would be too strong the mall you know that would benefit the jews at that time mausel uh, is what uh a an astrological sign for that particular month and so they're trying to figure out the operative you know optimal time to attack the Jews use, using these lots and stuff and you know we didn't mention the lot lots have a pretty prominent place in the, the, the scripture that a lot of people don't think about now obviously um, Haman's the bad guy here and maybe we can talk more about him later but yeah but you know also a lot of people don't realize that Judas, the apostle, was replaced by the casting of lots. And so yeah. most people nowadays, most Christians, Messianics, and, and you know, modern religious people would not only see casting lots to determine some sort of outcome as superstitious, but they would see it as even... Um, what? Of the devil. Yeah, I mean, they, they would probably mm. automatically categorize it and put it over there into that category sure. of dark arts, that sort of thing. But uh, actually, you know, these things, it even says that uh, in the book of Proverbs, the mm. lots are mentioned a few times, and it says that the lots cast, but the whole disposing of is uh, thereof is of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Similar to the um, Urim and Tumim, or Urim and Thummim that we'll be actually planning on discussing this coming week that were behind the breastplate of the high priest that a lot of things were determined by these things. But it's a long, we could probably spend all yeah. time on the topic of that. Well, and doesn't it say something, just not about this particular casting of loss, but doesn't it say of the lot that it causes contention to cease yes, or something like that? Yes, the lot causes Okay. Like it did with the, uh, the apostles or other things to... You know, if you know they weren't sure about, you know, right. and I think that there was probably um, probably a, uh, a strict set of rules. I don't think that it was just Anybody? to figure out the best lottery numbers or things right. of that nature. I mean, these were pretty serious things. Vetted, you know? well, and vetted candidates mm -hmm. with whatever, however they vetted by, mm -hmm. just somebody. But they knew how to do it. Yeah. You know, and and it was part of the custom, not only of people like Haman and that group that hopefully we'll talk about in a second, but also the Israelites, you know. Well, and its authority, its verdict, mm -hmm. its outcome was final. Mm -hmm. Like they, everyone, the reason it caused, the lot causes contention to cease is that it's, the outcome is, is accepted by everyone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is very different than today's society who would just say, well, we're not going to leave something this important up to a roll of the dice or whatever yeah. to be decided. You know, we need to pray about it. We, I mean, and I'm not knocking praying about things, but, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes things, I, especially who to replace Judas with, I mean, and there's all kinds of things that are just too important. It's all, It would almost be a relief to be able to do something this way because you would put it in God's hands, which is what they did, mm -hmm. to just speak through through this thing. And he did, and they appointed the new guy to mm -hmm. take Judas's place. Mm -hmm. Everybody accepted it. It wasn't weird or occultic to them or, or mm -hmm. satanic to them. Right, yeah, right. Occultic, you might want to yeah. uh, define that term because uh, a lot of times, I mean, our our. Term, terminology and vocabulary, not just ours, I mean just in general, is charged. And a lot of times there's words that have certain charges or connotations that in many time, in many respects are not necessarily accurate. Yeah. That we just have an inherited an idea of certain words. Well, what, that's why I kind of corrected myself and said satanic. Because 
as Christians, modern day Christians, we've inherited a definition of occultic that's technically not accurate as far as the history of the word and what it actually means. Occult means hidden, not satanic. And so once you start kind of understanding that, it, it'll it change your viewpoint a little bit. Not that there's not things that God forbids, but when we're taught that things are occultic by a superstitious church system, and I mean, I'm not knocking it. I, it's I'm, not synonymous with Satanism no, or anything necessarily. No, I not mean, necessarily. It could, could be. We use it that yeah. way, but... You know, we have these biases that we've inherited from our belief system, and they're just reteaching us the way they were taught, and I understand that. But when you start going back through the scriptures, particularly the prophets and things in the Old Testament, you're going to come up against some things that if you're honest about it, it's going to defy your ideas about what witchcraft is, about right. what is occultic or what is satanic. Well, I mean, We've some inherited in, Bobby Boucher theology yeah, from of the devil. Point. Yeah, right. everything's on... on of the devil and mama said or pastor said and nothing really has been searched out or substantiated but mm -hmm. that's a, probably a whole nother different yeah topic for another time so Haman puts this edict in place to destroy the Jews on a certain day and they sent it out throughout the land and I guess Mordecai sees this edict and he rents his clothes and he's doing the sackcloth and ashes thing in a certain part of the palace or the city. And it's told to Esther, and she sends and says, what's wrong? And he tells her, and she didn't know. And um, I don't remember exactly how that unfolds, but there comes this point where he tells her, you know, don't think that just because you are the queen and his favorite that you're going to escape this salvation and help will arise for the Jews but you and your house will be destroyed or suffer badly I don't remember exactly uh, I've kind of crammed and all these details in um, and I don't remember exactly if he says we'll die but salvation will arise from another quarter but you know there'll be bad things maybe death again you can tell me if he says we'll die and so she sends back and says have everybody there don't eat and drink for three days or nights. I and my maids will also do that because it's forbidden to enter into the secret or the inner chamber of the king without being summoned. And so it's I... It's death. Yeah, it's it's a death verdict. Death penalty yeah. for doing that. Well... Unless... Unless he extends his golden scepter to you. And I guess that didn't happen very often. And probably it didn't happen very often that people just went in uninvited. So she does the three day and three night fast and her servants also do this and she goes in unto the king and he extends she finds favor in his eyes he extends the golden scepter to her and he asks you know what do you want to risk your life like this and she said i ask invite you to come to a banquet i will serve for you i and, guess it's tomorrow and, and haman and, okay. and so he's intrigued by this i mean think about <laughs> I mean, really, to be humanly honest and human, what person would not be flattered that someone risks their life to come to ask you to lunch? I mean, at you and your friend, and so he says, okay, and Haman's on his way home, and he's happy about this because he's been honored by name by Esther, but then on his way home, he, see, he, see, <laughs> <laughs> he sees Mordecai again, who doesn't bow, and he just gets mad all over again, and he goes home, and he's upset Ruined about it. Day. Yeah, I mean, and he tells his wife and his friends who come over that night or who he's talking to, you know, all of this has been done to me. I have this honor. I have this prestige. And the king, I was even honored by Esther today. I was the only man named to come to this banquet she's going to serve. But because Mordecai the Jew won't bow to me, it's as nothing. Yeah. Because this one man won't bow mm -hmm. to my homage, to, to, mm -hmm. in homage to me. All of these other things are as nothing. And his wife is, gives him some counsel. <laughs> sounds, sounds reasonable to me. Good gravy. Let a gallows be built and 50, 50 cubits, cubits high, mm -hmm. which sounds, I mean, like a, it's substantial, mm -hmm. so that he'll be hanged. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, that doesn't sound reasonable to me when someone doesn't 
do what you think they should, whatever. It's a Bible story. And so, I mean, it, it happened, but it's, it's one of those things that when we read in the scriptures, it's just a scripture. And so we just take it for granted and see it through a scriptural paradigm. But when I kind of put myself in that, like, well, what if that happened in our country? And we would say, well, it, it would never happen here. But we've seen things happen in the last year that we never thought we would have seen. Oh, there's a lot of this in our right. country right now. Yeah, the that, spirit's behind a lot of this. Let's kind of get through the kind of basically what happened and then maybe we can recap sure. on a little bit but so the i'm not fast but enough, basically so. we have like a provident providential uh insomnia that takes hold of the king and he can't sleep mm. uh, uh well you might want to finish your thought with uh basically Haman and the king show up for lunch at <laughs> esther's place and he he said okay now tell me what what, what can really i do want. for you yeah. up, up to half my kingdom and she said okay if it please the king well, let's the, do this again tomorrow okay okay and so at some point is it the next day then yeah mm-hmm. and so they and maybe i'm getting a little of this out of sequence but this is the basic overview and so they decide to go back the next day and the next day Haman gets up and Somehow the king is brought to his attention that Mordecai fooled the plot on his life, but no reward was ever done for him. And so he's thinking about how to reward Mordecai when Haman comes into his presence. And <clears throat> the king's thinking, we really need to do something nice for this guy. He saved my life and nothing was ever done. And so he addresses Haman, what should be done to the man in whom the king delights to honor? And Haman, of course, naturally assumes that he's talking about him. And so he just pulls out all the stops, like take the royal robe, take a good royal horse or whatever, and take the some kind of thing. Is it a crown or something? And the ring, and put on, the king's okay, ring, I think. Okay, some jewelry and put on well, his hand. Say, no, and, that's not true. That's not the ring, but let's see here. Um, I read it, and I don't remember what it said, but something like put on his head. Okay, what? Okay. And then taken, like, put on a horse and taken through the streets of Shushan and a crier saying, Thus shall it be done to the man in whom the king delights to honor. I mean, he just pulls out all the stops. And then the <laughs> mic drop then is, verse 10. is, and then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horses thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew. And all of a sudden... Haman's fortunes begin to reverse, and I think dread, dread starts to come yeah. on him. Yeah, he tells his wife about this, and she's like, "Oh no!" Yeah, uh, I think this maybe this is not going to go well. Yeah, for you. I may have gotten the sequence uh, kind <laughs> of. And she was out, kind but... of uh, prodding him into, you know, doing the gallows. The yeah. So, stuff. and he tells her that, and she says, um, "Well, if you've begun to fall before Mordecai, who's of the seed of the Jews, he will prevail," which is is a strange thing to say. I I don't know. I don't know if she's just looking at the fact that his fortunes seem to be changing, and I mean, I don't know why you can't recover your she, footing. I even think if that she probably understands the the history, but maybe. Do you want to go ahead and kind of? get through and, and explain you know well you told to me end. to give an overview yeah, I mean, yeah, i'm not trying I'm, to be too no, long in I this mean, but it's, there's a lot to it there is and you're probably sick of hearing no, it. I, I, okay go ahead and so he goes back to the second feast of esther and the king says okay so what is it really i mean what are you really wanting of me basically and she says i and my people are sold and tells him the situation that we got people coming after us, and he asks who is doing this, and she said, this wicked Haman. And the king's so mad that he gets up and walks out of there, and when Haman sees the handwriting on the wall, he falls on Esther, falls at her feet, like falls before her to beg for his life, and at this moment, the king chooses to come back in, and he mistakes Haman that he's accosting the queen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it couldn't be planned any better. Yeah. I think this is the only book that doesn't have the name of Yahweh right. in it. No, doesn't mention doesn't mention God by any name in the Hebrew. Yeah, and so, but you can in English or or, or even he, in the Hebrew. But we'll maybe talk about that in a minute. And because it's there. Well, and he's totally there pulling all the strings and, you know, things, events go pretty fast where 
Haman is hanged on his own gallows and his sons end up being killed. And because the, and his house is given over to Esther as a Mm -hmm. possession, but because the edict of the Medes and the Persians can't be changed once it's law, they can't just say, sorry, you know, they have to do something to counteract this law, this edict. And so he gives all the Jews in all the provinces the right and the mandate to go out and defend themselves against anybody who would come at them to try to kill them. And even it says that the kings, like in the king's household, I don't know how it puts it, his his lieutenants and his, it, the way I thought of it was his military, fought with the Jews because it said the fear of Mordecai had fell, had fallen on them. And fear of the Jews had fallen on different people in different provinces, and the man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. And so they ended up getting the victory uh, over their enemies. That It's interesting to me, this is a very stressful situation that people can rise up. I mean, think about putting yourself into that situation where the seed, it goes out in sulfur, where we are, sulfur, Oklahoma, and it goes out into your city that anybody that doesn't like the Jews has the right to get get their weapons and just go put them to death and their kids and their wives and all of that. I mean, it would be a very, very stressful, anxiety-ridden situation. And, you know, you would think, like, nowadays we would be very, um, I would think, well, Lord, why can't you just save us? I mean, why can't you send angels? Why can't you do this to just save us? And he did save them. By giving them the right to defend themselves. An ability to do that. Right. And so they prevailed and... And rooted out their enemies. Like they, the thing is, they didn't even, even the people who, like when the edict, before the edict went out, you might not know exactly who your enemy would be. Like they're, they're among the population Mm -hmm. and they're kind of like little nigglers and nibblers at your heels you know just kind of wanting your downfall or whatever but they're not ever really identified the interesting thing about the edict is that it identifies them they're Mm -hmm. coming at you Mm -hmm. with a weapon and so through this very harrowing process they rid themselves of this yeah yeah Mm -hmm. rebel rousing Mm -hmm. um strata of the society Mm -hmm. even though it's they had to do battle Mm -hmm. They were able to do it, and God was with them. And so they prevailed, and in celebration, we end up with the festival of Purim in, um, on the 14th and 15th day of Adar. And then, which, by the way, we, we're just like a month away from Passover, because Purim is always going to be a, a month away from that. And so, which, uh, and it goes on to say that this will be a remembrance from now on, and celebrated from year to year and you know it involved um sending gifts and celebration and having a festival and also charity for the for the poor and such and so that's a little bit i mean that's a pretty good overview i think of the the basic story i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of details in there that we didn't get to but you want to maybe now kind of take it a little bit deeper and give a little bit more of the deeper background of of the the spiritual warfare that's going on here and the the spiritual because it, we read in the scripture you know in the new testament that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high pl- places and all of that that were unseen forces is really what's bringing all these things about what's affecting people is un- what's affecting flesh and blood is unseen spiritual forces and these Haman. Why don't you give back a little bit of background on that line Agag. and where he came from? Agag. Mm-hmm. And even going back before that. Well, I'd have to go back and read a little bit more with Agag. But okay. was he a? Who was he from? Well, tell about Agag, and then we'll tell. Okay. I mean, I just, I just quickly forget about. some of this. Yeah, Agag was a king that Saul captured, King Saul, and was told by Samuel to not keep him alive, to put him to the sword. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what the deal was. The animals and Yeah, else. I mean, just everything mm-hmm. to do with him, like his line, mm-hmm. just wipe him out. Um, 
And so Samuel captures him, and for whatever reason, he keeps him alive. Saul kept him alive. Saul kept him alive. Okay, okay. I I hadn't read it recently, and I couldn't remember. Basically, that's what happened. Well, there had to be a reason. And so Samuel delays in coming to see Saul, and he finally arrives. And one of the, I think maybe the first thing he says is, what is this bleeding Mm -hmm. of sheep in my ears? He understands that Saul, instead of putting Agag to death and killing everything pertaining to Agag, that he, he disobeyed the word of the Lord because he thought better. He thought he knew better. And basically, I think, if memory serves, Saul says something to the effect of, well, these could be offered in offerings to the, right, the Lord. Yeah. Kind of like the sin of the golden calf a little mm-hmm. bit. Like, we're going to do this a feast to Yahweh. Well, mm-hmm. that's not what Yahweh asked you to do, so do what I ask. Well, and he responded that, obedience is better than sacrifice because a lot of times you know we tend to rationalize things and say well i can do this or that even though i didn't maybe i'm not going about things the way god says and that's that's exactly what happened and he he said obedience is better than sacrifice and and uh it's in that passage that he says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and Stubbornness says the sin of idolatry. Pretty powerful, Mm -hmm. powerful verse there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, it was around this time that Judges talks about there was no prophet, there was no word of the Lord like before that, Mm -hmm. and that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. And this this man, uh, Agag, because Saul did not immediately Mm -hmm. kill him, he was able to get out and. he was with his wife or yeah. one of his wives and ended up getting her pregnant mm-hmm. when if Saul had just killed him, when Samuel said to kill him, that wouldn't have happened. And so his seed was maintained, even though when Samuel shows up, he hacks a gag to pieces. And I believe that's what the King James Version mm-hmm. actually says, hacks, mm-hmm. like hacks him to mm-hmm. pieces. Right. But not before he gets his, one of his wives pregnant and the line is continued. And ultimately, we get Haman because <clears throat> out of that of Saul's mistake. And if we back Rebellion. up further, these all of these, just like we had, we were talking about uh, Mordecai and Esther being of Benjamin, or at least we know that Mordecai was. And since they're cousins, you know, I'm assuming that she probably is too of the Benjamin family. Assume. But uh, so, and we were talking about some of the characteristics in other people. Saul was a Benjamite himself. Interesting, I never really thought about that, that Saul, the guy who caused this mess, was a Benjamite, and the guy who's fixing it is a Benjamite. And I never really thought about that. Well, and it's interesting. The traits that are in you, your personality, they can be used to serve God, or they can be used to be in rebellion to God. Mm-hmm. And either way... It's an extremity. Mm -hmm. It's an extreme stubbornness that causes you not to bow, maybe on pain of death, or Mm -hmm. that causes you to absolutely rebel against Mm -hmm. the word of the Lord by the mouth of his prophet. Mm -hmm. Well, this line that we're talking about here, and we haven't said the word yet, is the Amalekites. And they go all the way back. Amalek was a descendant of Esau, of whom... God said that Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And he said of Amalek. Amalek is like the most hated, apparently, group by the God of Israel of anyone. And we even read in a recent Torah portion in the book of Exodus, not long after the uh, crossing at the Sea of Reeds or Red Sea, the Amalekites, they're a very devious people, they came in and were sneaking around and killing off uh, the, the, weak. Weak, the weaker people uh, in back of the, uh, the Israelite. As they were uh, moving through the wilderness, yeah. they would kind of lurk in the back and pick off the weak and the feeble, the old. And this was the battle that uh, Moses, uh, when his hands were up, the Israelites would... Pr- under the leadership of Joshua would prevail, but as his hands would get tired, they would start losing, and the Amalekites would begin to prevail. Symbolic. Yeah, and the Amalek, uh, Amalek in, in Hebrew 
is, and I can't, I can't remember the, uh, the number, the numerical value, but the gematria of Amalek is the same thing as the Hebrew word for doubt. And so it's this idea of um, this, if someone tries to cause you to doubt what God says, that they're operating from the spirit of Amalek. And it's with this, the Am Amalekites or Amalek that God said he would be at, at war, war forever and he would ultimately blot out the remembrance from of under this, heaven. Yeah, of this group of people. They're very, very uh, evil. Well, and some people even have said that they think, and maybe they have proof, I don't know, that Hitler was of the line of Amalek. I don't, I don't know I if believe that's true. that. I believe I, there's not proof directly, but there's a lot of strange circumstantial yeah. evidence about it. And we don't really have time to get into it this evening, but when you begin to, uh, and you could look it up online or, or get with us sometime, maybe we can talk about it. When we begin to look at in the uh, the Hebrew text of the way these things are, are sorted out, and because Esther asked, the thing that she asked, uh, she asked for the, not only the death of Haman to be hung on the, the poetic justice, to be hung on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai, is a totally, totally switching of positions there, but then she requested that the king hang the ten sons of Haman on on this also. Which sounds like a bloodthirsty thing to say, but if Saul had just done his mm -hmm. job, all they would, of... They would have picked up right where he left yep. off. Yep. And so they did this, but they did that, but then she asked again, and it's kind of a strange mystery in oh. the text here. And, An anomaly. Yeah, okay, it is. And okay. there's a lot of anomalies when you begin to look at the, the Hebrew. And there's a lot of facets of this. And I'm just kind of giving you a quick quick rundown to cut to the chase. Because I can't remember who all of these. Hitler even made a, a, a reference in a speech that, and I don't remember exactly. Uh, essentially, if the Jews prevail, they will have a second Purim. Hmm. And... One of the, uh, in 1946 at the Nuremberg trial, that there were, there were 10 Nazis that were hung, and basically this is foretold in the book of Esther by looking at the textual anomalies of the enlarged Vav and these reduced letters that all basically give us the date, 1946, or the equivalent in the, in the Hebrew years. And... The la uh, one of those guys who Nazis that was hung, his last words were something about Purim. Hmm. The very last words of these ten, basically the ten sons of Haman that were killed. It's an interesting thing, mm -hmm. and I think there was a video on YouTube about this. But yeah, I, I remember this. I'm trying to remember the rabbi that I, I heard some years ago. Talking about that, but yeah, it's really some some cool stuff. There's so many levels <laughs> to get into, but yeah, that this this stuff is uh, because that's what this has been tried over and over again of to exterminate the Jewish people and in the Israelite people, and the this is a spiritual battle, and just like the the adversary, which she calls Esther refers to him Haman as the adversary and wicked Haman mm -hmm. and he, just as he was trying to destroy the people of God the the dragon is wroth and went to destroy basically the woman and the remnant of her seed those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua and there's just over the years this has been tried many times and in our day, it's rather strange. Yeah. And I don't know if you, you know about this, but or if you paid attention. Of course, a lot of the more prominent left-leaning politicians in... There's already been a, a, a very stark shift in the policy relating to the nation of Israel. Very. But even, even the Jewish people as well. Um, a lot of these... Uh, the leftists are very anti-Semitic and are constantly making 
very derogatory statements against Israel and the Jewish people. On the other hand, a lot of the people on the far right are as well. And it's very strange, and Julie and I were talking about this week because there was there was someone who was telling me a bunch of stuff uh, a few days ago about uh, basically that Hitler had the right idea and that was he was trying to help the world and, and save the world from these pesky Jews. And this is from someone, I mean, if, if someone is a raving lunatic, that's one thing. But when you start, well, when you start hearing this kind of thing. And he was, he's from the right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Out of people that you know, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. it's like you're really going to blame mm-hmm. all the I've ills couple, of the world? A couple of people that I know in the last couple of years. Well, and, and I mean, just because there are a group, there's a group of people that kind of kings of the earth that oversee everything, mm-hmm. and maybe wealthy, some wealthy Jews happen to be part of that. I mean, that but they don't the, get to speak for right. the whole nation. No. And, but isn't it interesting that... The far left and far right agree on one thing. Right. That this is the problem right. of the world. How is that possible? Just like, which tells you what spirit right. that this thing is operating right. by. Yep. And it's alive and well. Mm-hmm. And that's, I wanted to get into this just a little bit in our last few minutes of just kind of tying this together, that this isn't just a story that we look back and say, oh, God wrought a great deliverance. He did. We just keep seeing Three wise, this. brave people. He too. did, and I, exactly who they wouldn't knew, bow? And they well, but they knew when to hold them and when yeah, to fold them. They did. They had wisdom. And see, that's the thing. You you've got people sometimes that are wise that lack courage. True. And you have people that are courageous that are dumb and lack wisdom. <laughs> or True. Because you know, and I remember again, ironically, this same individual um, was a little upset with me over situation some some time back and he thought that I um, I didn't want to get involved in this because of fear and I said no uh, and he kind of got aggravated and, and I said no it's just that I'm not stupid uh, basically this is a know, certain situation yeah, it's that, a, I can't go into no it, but, obviously, he, but he wouldn't just jump in with both feet into this situation he was using wisdom and just like Esther and Mordecai did mm-hmm. Mordecai said Okay. Don't don't let your identity be known yet. Yet. Right. And she just played it cool and he played it cool. Now he he didn't bow and there's a whole there's a whole lot of stuff that would be interested in get into that, but they played they were patient, they played their cards right, and then and they were courageous when it mattered. And then when it's time to stand up and let, risk their lives, you know, as Esther did, and as Mordecai, as Mordecai did, did. They, they did it, but they weren't stupid about it. They were no. wise in the way that they did it. And, I mean, one thing that really speaks to me in this is that Esther Hadassah seems to, and, and was, just kind of a pawn of everyone, um, even, even a pawn of God, to the purpose of God. And she didn't always know, I mean, Mordecai says, hush, be quiet about your ethnicity, okay. And then this, the edict is, goes out, and he's upset, rending his clothes, and she's asking him what's wrong. And he said, you know, this is what's happened, I need you to go before the king. And she's like, well, that's death. And he's like, you know, this is, maybe you came into this place for such a time as this. Mm-hmm. And don't think that you'll escape because you are the queen, Salvation will arise for them some other place, but, you know, it's going to go bad for us. And so she obviously, by her actions, she was willing to do what he told her to do. She just didn't recognize yet that's what she needed to do. Like, And I can really identify this of being in certain places at certain times. And it's like, do I go full throttle or do I mash the gas or do I put on the brake or do I put it in park? Like, I don't always know what to do. And then some people around you just seem to know what it's time to do. Mordecai knew don't say anything right now. And then he knew it's time to say something. Mm -hmm. And, and she listened to him and she was directed by him Mm -hmm. and she was a tool uh, in the right way Mm -hmm. in, in the hand of God, in the hand of Mordecai. And I mean, she was there for such a time as that. Mm -hmm. And we, I think more than anything else at this point in time, we really have to pray for discernment for Mm -hmm. bravery Mm -hmm. and for discernment. 
it's a similar thing because just like uh, Haman, the Amalekite and his his people were Mordecai did not reflect back to him the reality that he mm-hmm. wanted. And, and I remember talking about this subject uh, not too long ago. We've talked about it quite a bit. They were in a canceled culture, too, at that time. Yeah, very canceled. And that because he would not, or, you know, you you have uh, homosexuals, transgenders, and, and, and such, that if you don't reflect back to them the reality that they're a woman or a man or whatever they are, or then a lot of these people well and uh I, I don't know if you guys have been hearing about it you know amazon is taking down books I, I, there was a book on this subject a very scholarly book that was taken down on uh what was it called i can't remember right off the hand i, I heard an interview with the author of that book and they're they're taking this down libraries are getting rid of we're we're seeing a lot of things that happened before world war ii with yep. the eliminating books and the tightening of freedom of speech and other civil liberties and rights and so uh yeah it's uh it's 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 good for us <clears throat> to be conscious and praying of the times that we're in and it is the same spirit making its rounds again unfortunately and knowing that kind of helps in some ways it can be a little bit um, scary, mm-hmm. but it can make sense of a lot of senseless things that if you just live in your current time with in a vacuum and you don't know how to extrapolate biblical history and you don't understand what you're looking at, it just seems to kind of come out of nowhere and go nowhere and you can't really find a rhyme or reason. But when you understand that there's a spirit, an adversary, behind these things and I know that sounds real fundamentalist I understand that a lot of people could watch this and say that sounds fundamentalist but you explain to me then how over millennia this same group of people keeps getting targeted over and over and over and over for the most part trying to mind their own business and run their own things in their own lane You know, it's like, we're not telling you to be circumcised and don't eat what we eat and do our practices and do our, we're just, we just want the freedom to do them ourselves. Nope, not good enough because somehow you doing this makes me feel bad about myself and I feel condemned when you won't eat the thing that I eat that you don't. That was one of Haman's charges. They've got strange laws that are different than us. Big deal. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like if, and this is, this is hard to kind of be defined, but and it's probably a, a topic for another day, but the whole thing of are you acting in the spirit of condemnation or is condemnation falling on people simply because you are living according to the word of the Lord? And it's two very different things. I don't think people need to be taking the word of the Lord and trying to beat people into submission. That's wrong. That's not your jurisdiction. That's out of your lane. But if you, minding your own business, what is yours to mind and and yours to do, you are living the best way you know how according to the word and the spirit of the Lord. If you not partaking, not speaking, not acting, not living, not driving, not anything like the culture is, and they fall under condemnation. I mean, it's just like the guys, the men in um, Sodom, when the angels came in. Yeah. The angels came in to the city gate, and it was at night or right at the time of the night coming on, and Lot's like, oh, no, you know, we can't have this because I know what's going to happen. And so he brings it, them into his home, and so the men of the city, I don't even know how you know two strangers come into your city, start gathering around Lot's house, and they're like, bring out those two guys that came in that we may know them, that we may be with them. And he's like, don't do so wickedly, my brothers. And, they're, and, and is it true that that was wicked? Yes. It is true that that was wicked. Well, how do you know? Because the city was destroyed, not just for that, because it goes into what? Isaiah? Ezekiel. Ezekiel, all the sins of the city and injustice was top of the list, but the city was destroyed for all of its practices. Um, 
and they said, we will deal worse with you lot than with them because you're a stranger and you come in to be a judge over us. Well, Mm -hmm. okay, who's knocking on whose door here? Mm Mm-hmm. He yeah. didn't go out to to all the men of Sodom and stand out in the city square and say, hear ye, hear ye, you all doing this are wicked and evil, and I need to let you know that so that you can change your ways. No, they were knocking on his door, trying to get at people who he had, angels he had brought under his care, and so they were out of of their lane. Yeah, yeah. I'll say. Well, Big yeah. time. So... I've kind of lost my train of thought on all that, but I was tying in. In terms of the the culture, the resentment from the yes, culture yes, yes. for people not just conforming but condoning what they do, and when someone like Mordecai doesn't bow to the Hamans of this world and their agenda or the children of Israel, in the Hebrew children in Daniel's time that refused to bow when the music's played. There's God has always had a remnant and preserved a remnant for himself, and that's one of the interesting things about this story is that the laws of cause and effect, whenever there is a Jezebel, an Elijah will arise. Whenever there is a Haman, a Mordecai <clears throat> and Esther will arise, and so, and in our time, it, te- it te- when the enemy comes in like a flood, I will raise up a standard against against mm-hmm. it, and so, and if you won't be the standard, God will raise up he a will. standard uh, he will. from somewhere, just yeah. like Mordecai told Esther. He said, you know, if you're not willing to stick your neck out you know, you might not make it anyway, and and God will, he'll deliver this people somehow, with or without you, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, so, you know, be that person, whatever, whatever it is, but also be wise, and know, you know, and seek God on, on, there's a time and season for every purpose under the sun, and there was a time to sort of stay under the radar and be be quiet and not really go all in and there's the time to go all in and they knew it well and to me our society it, it, the problems whether they're modern or they're in the scriptures there is an objective standard and then there's subjective realities and how we feel about it and i think one of the things that i, I think is characterizing our modern current time especially in the united states is you know, you can say this issue, that issue, this issue, that issue, as if there's a hundred thousand issues. But I think at its very heart, what I see is that people are trying to do away with the objective standard, and they get angry when you say there is an objective standard. Mm-hmm. They get angry because they can't define whatever they want to to be reality. I mean, if you want to sit here and tell yourself a certain thing, about reality and you want to frame it for yourself I mean you're given the free enough will to do that I mean you'll bear the consequences of whatever story it is good or bad that you're telling yourself but there is an objective reality out there regardless of what we believe regardless of how we feel about it that caused the world and all of creation to come into being that maintains all of creation to the degree that we align as much as possible to that objective truth and conform ourselves to that image we bear the good consequences of that, and to the degree that we cross that and call something else the truth, we bear the consequences of that too. And I mean, even everything from like GMO seeds of going in and genetically modifying the seed of different foods and different plants, I mean, everything's a hybrid now, where nature's not good enough, we're going to go in and change it to make the crops last longer. I mean, all these reasons why we want to jack with the pattern. Vaccin- certain vaccinations. Yes, I mean, you know, God said with you the... have like uh, things that alter DNA. Yeah. And... Uh, Right, that transgenderism alter, well, and all of this stuff. It's, that uh, alters the pattern. And I mean, it's... T- seeding clouds. Right. Uh, on and on and on. Yep. It's, uh, it all has abortion. It all, in some ways, has to do with the destruction of the right seed or contamination of the um, 
of the seeds, you well, know, which is the whole thing from early Genesis, the enmity between two seeds in when, Genesis 3. When the Torah was given, God said, I call to witness against you this day heaven and earth. And there's the witness of the stars and all that that is. And then there are witnesses in the earth. And I mean, man, when he puts his tool to something with the best of intentions, he will jack it up every time and there's contamination but the witness in the earth, to me, is nature, the way God built it and made it. And that's not to say that, I mean, people are born with diseases. They're born with strange mutations. I can't explain all of that, but I know somewhere along the way, God saw that it was good, that it was very good. And I'm not sure exactly what all occurs to mess up that pattern. But <clears throat> to the degree that we start not being able to tell the truth about things and not being able to recognize the truth, is to the degree we start paying for that in our souls and in our bodies to the degree that we will kill people that disagree with us and think we do God a service, that the deception is so great, the Bible says, they will kill you and think that they do God a service mm -hmm. because they don't like what you're saying. They don't like you for the testimony that you carry. I mean, the, the two witnesses, they had power to do different things for the whole days of their testimony and then they were killed and while their dead bodies were in the streets men gave gifts mm -hmm. and were ecstatic and happy mm -hmm. because the testimony of the objective standard had been silenced for a little while mm -hmm. because it was different than theirs That's right. and in, and we're seeing that in our society I mean you can't ever lose sight over the long haul if you're a believer if you're a believer you can't lose sight over the long haul that the all the issues come down to the war between two seeds mm -hmm. and flesh sure. and blood are not our problem and yet we still have to learn to deal somehow with flesh and blood issues and i don't have all the answers for that but we have to be smart and we have to be discerning and we have to ask for the wisdom of god and bravery that's right that's right and as these people did and prevailed and so tonight we're remembering what they did and we're trying to also learn learn from what they did and one other real quick thing uh, Julie said this is the one book in the Bible that doesn't mention God and that's true on a on a literal <laughs> level but again if you look at the equal letter distance sequencing ELS or the Torah codes God's name is spelled in there a number of times uh, hmm. I think both forwards and backwards and I can't remember how many times it's been a little while hmm. since I've looked at that that's but. good to know Anyway, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Hope you all have uh, a good Purim and uh, a good day and stay safe. And uh, God bless you and your families. Hope to see you guys this week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.